Okay, so I'll start again. So, um, so uh, thank you for attending this session on climate risk and disclosure in ESG. Um, I'm David Blount, a professor in the Department of Accountancy and Finance, if you don't know me. And we have three speakers today. Um, first of all, uh, Martina uh, Linda Lukey um, from Macquarie University, a professor there of, of, uh, and um, a, a well-known climate researcher. So we're looking forward to her keynote. Uh, just the rules of engagement, you have about 25 minutes um, and then five minutes for Q&A, and then we'll get on to the two other uh, presenters. So, uh, Martina, if you're online, um, the, oh, hello. Um, hello, I am indeed. Good to see you, David. How are you? Glad that you appear. So the floor is yours if you'd like to share your screen and, uh, again, 25 minutes. Okay, wonderful. All right, let me see how I can do this uh, screen sharing here if efficiently. All right, I hope I'm on your screen. Is that all working? You're perfect. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so thank you so much for the invitation uh, to join the symposium today. And yeah, unfortunately, obviously, I can't be there with you in person at the moment, but hopefully at a future symposium or at a future conference. So the uh, topic that I am going to discover in this, uh, in this keynote today is just essentially focusing around you know the question is there perhaps you know a need for us to look at um you know or look beyond climate finance um you know i know this is a symposium of climate finance but i guess i wanted to add a few critical points and a discussion around the question you know is this actually you know, um, a focus where we might potentially risk, you know, losing sight of some other um, important uh, aspects and parameters that are also of importance, you know, and how can we make sure that the research we are doing is connecting to broader environmental change frameworks, you know, to broader environmental changes, and how can we perhaps make sure that we factor that in to financing and investment decisions and certainly the research as well, you know, beyond a focus on, on climate finance. So essentially, um, I guess we've all seen in the last two years, right, the challenges and risks that we've been facing. You know, I think everyone is probably only too well aware of the significant impacts that the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has had on all of us, especially you know, in terms of the lockdowns, the social distancing measures, and also the significant economic impacts, right? So I think we found ourselves in a very radically changed global environment. Um, what we are seeing at the moment, and I think that's definitely of great concern and also really emerging on the horizon for all of us is this question, okay, you know, sort of what's next? And that's perhaps not a question we want to explore at this point in time, given that we are still mid-recovery from one crisis, but there are certainly, and we can see that from all the scientific reports that are coming out, there's certainly a greater concern, a greater, you know, a risk potentially that we already see other impacts, you know, on the horizon. And that's uh, not just resulting from the immediate impacts of the COVID pandemic, you know, there's certainly currently concern, um, you know, what is going to be happening in terms of monetary policy, in terms of economic stability, given that we're seeing so much, you know, recovery money being poured into the economy, right? But what we can see as well at the moment is, you know, that the science tells us there are greater concerns that we need to be tackling. And climate change has certainly received a lot of attention. And I think for good reasons, and that's definitely very justified when we see the significant global impacts resulting from climate change in terms of, you know, it's obviously not just driving global temperature changes, but has a lot of other impacts in terms of changes of extreme weather events and other types of negative outcomes that we see also on the social side, right? So I think that's definitely a very warranted and very immediate concern. But when we look beyond that, there are, you know, perhaps even bigger concerns that we might ultimately face, not just the crisis around climate change, but around other global risks, you know, in particular biodiversity has recently um, uh, received a lot of attention because we are seeing a very, very significant extent of nature loss, of species loss. And these types of risks, I think, have sort of not really entered 
um, discussions up until very recently. Um, and I think there's definitely also the same disconnect happening that we've often noticed, uh, you know, that's also happening when we look into, you know, finance and climate. Uh, and I think it's the same for other types of global risks as well. So we see definitely similar concerns here around, you know, connecting climate change to other types of, of global risks and then connecting uh, finance research to that as well, right? So ultimately, I think the real challenge that we are facing as researchers as well is to make contributions here that address this sort of larger and broader risk profile that is currently already emerging, right? So we've got the data, the data is definitely there. We can see that these risks are fundamental and substantial, but we are certainly faced with the challenge, okay, how do we actually resolve that in terms of, you know, addressing it in the sense that we do have frameworks in place that are perhaps not just addressing how these risks are addressing companies, but also what companies can actually do to address the risks themselves or perhaps even take proactive actions to alleviate the risks, you know, not just in terms of mitigation, but even perhaps proactive responses and proactive restorative responses as well, right? So what we are currently perhaps seeing, and some of you might have seen this, uh, this particular picture popping up on social media recently, it's been used in particular in the context with the recent uh, COP26 conference that was going on because there's been definitely a lot of concern around, you know, that we are finding ourselves in a situation where so much attention is currently um, focusing on climate change and on carbon emissions as a result, right? And I think, as I said, for good reason, right? I think climate change is definitely a very substantial, very global problem, but I guess there's also been greater attention recently that perhaps that focus might have shifted our focus away from other and perhaps equally important and perhaps sometimes, you know, even more pressing types of issues um, you know, and there are only a couple of them listed on the slide here, right? As I mentioned, biodiversity loss is certainly one of them, but we have also got a lot of other unresolved issues going on. And some of them are connected to climate change more directly than others, right? So you can kind of see that it's like a whole range of interconnected types of issues, right? Um, I mean, for us, I guess, you know, it kind of, there is definitely, I guess, a very direct and easy connection to be made to focus on carbon emissions, right? Carbon emissions are direct driver behind climate change. From a corporate perspective, we can easily measure them, which makes it, you know, also quite accessible for us as researchers to gather carbon data, to you know, factor that into our estimations. So this is actually data that's relatively easily accessible for us and that we can you know, access from company reports or uh, alternatively you know, derive that information if we've got uh, other data sources available, be that around fossil fuel consumption or energy consumption, right? So I guess carbon for us, it's also been you know, a real, relatively easy to use metric in financial terms, right? And we can easily, you know, kind of see, okay, how is that related to all the measures that we're interested in? Financial performance, right? Uh, ESG ratings. So I guess what the point that I'm making is, right, that, um, you know, for us, it's also been relatively easy to engage with the topic of carbon and carbon emissions because data are relatively easily available. Whereas a lot of these other um, areas here that you see are probably a lot harder to research, right? Also, the question becomes, should we be actually considering these areas? Some of this might well and truly be beyond corporate boundaries, right? Where we kind of also get into this discussion, what should companies, what should industries actually be focusing on, which is certainly a discussion that's probably broader than the half hour that I've got available here today to present to you, right? Um, so just looking into what's currently happening on the global change front, um, from this definition here, you can see that, you know, concerns around this broader issue around global environmental change has definitely been around for a few decades now, right? So this awareness of global interconnected risks is not necessarily 
a new discovery for us, right? So it's, it was already, um, I mean, here you can see the Global Research Act from 1990 from the United States, right? There was already recognition back then that global change covers various different areas, not just climate change, right? But uh, extends to alterations in climate, land productivity, what's, what's happening in our oceans, right? As well as water resources and so on with the concern ultimately that this changes the capacity of the planet to sustain human life, which I guess is you know, the more worrying and fundamental consideration for us here. Many of you will be familiar with um, this framework here, the Planetary Boundaries Framework. That was an attempt to summarize this concern around global environmental change, right? Um, where a group of researchers have try to essentially you know collect the best available data that we've got available so there's a couple of iterations of this framework the first version came out in 2009 since then we've seen this update here and we've certainly also had extensions of this framework um, not just to the environmental but also to the social side um, so for instance the donut the so-called donut framework right that's extending the planetary boundaries here to um, include issues, you know, such as health or education or housing, essentially as it as it covers, you know, the social sustainability side, right? And this framework here, as you can see, is sort of you know showing us climate change as one of nine possible boundaries in our environment, right? And the ultimate uh, um, message that this framework is sending to us is, you know, that there are boundaries that should not be exceeded if we want to maintain and sustain human life on this planet, right? Perhaps of surprising for many is to see that actually climate change is currently in a sort of like, I wouldn't say a low rating here because it's definitely already reached increasing risk levels here, right? But it is perhaps not as advanced as some other concerns in particular around biosphere integrity and that directly relates to biodiversity loss here, right? And another huge concern is also around how much uh, phosphorus and nitrogen, so how much fertilizer we have emitted into the environment primarily through industrial processes, right? I mean, certainly the focus on climate change has resulted from the fact that climate change is connected to a lot of these boundaries, right? So it is directly connected um, to, for instance, you know, issues around fresh water, ocean acidification, and so on. Um, that's definitely one of the reasons. The other reason is, I think, why we had such a focus on this. There has been this idea that, you know, we it's really a global problem we need to tackle through, you know, this idea of setting up international treaties around it and ultimately tackling the root cause, which are carbon emissions, right? But you can see here, there is significant concern around other issues as well. And I think this has prompted a recent shift also in the finance world, right, to perhaps, you know, um, consider, okay, is climate change just the only issue that we should be tackling, or are there perhaps interconnected issues that we might also have to focus on? What we really don't know with all of these boundaries in this framework is ultimately, you know, how far can we go? With climate change, we've tried to approximate this with this problematic two degree target, right? Uh, since then, it's been revised obviously a fair few times since it's not a hard scientific target. There has been a lot of talk obviously around the 1.5 degree target and so on. But, you know, ultimately we don't really have good scientific evidence in place to suggest, you know, that if we only remain within these boundaries that everything will be fine. I guess, you know, the, the risk is the further we push on these limits, the more difficult ultimately it gets, you know, to contain unwanted outcomes of global environmental change. So I guess the situation that we are finding ourselves in, and that's probably, you know, um, also here coming out from the presentations around the planetary boundaries is, you know, that we do have this precarious situation where we are finding ourselves potentially in breach of a lot of these boundary conditions, right? And where we might ultimately risk a shift to an adverse outcome um, for the planet um, overall, right? <clears throat> 
So what does it mean for, you know, businesses and industries? And we've done a lot of work on this particular question also together. Um, so not just from an academic viewpoint, but certainly also together with our industry partners, right? So the focus has been definitely well and truly placed on climate change in terms of, you know, investigating limits on carbon emissions, investigating the impact on regulatory changes. I guess it's always been a very popular research question as well, right? What's the um, impact or value impact of the introduction of a particular carbon pricing mechanism? Um, and we're certainly also seeing a lot of research focusing on questions around the clean energy transition. I guess where we are currently entering somewhat uncharted territory in terms of research is to better understand what breaches of these other planetary boundaries could potentially mean, right? So what does it actually mean for us if there's a decline in ecosystems, right? What does it mean if there's a decline in natural resource inputs? Um, these are perhaps not really questions that we've pursued in the past, right? They're certainly also very future oriented and some of them are perhaps a bit, you know, less based in current data, but more and forecasted sort of trajectories, which also makes it very difficult for us to integrate that into decisions. Um, but at the moment, we definitely see a lot of concern around um, these types of questions, right, in particular around, um, you know, um, the degradation of ecosystems, you know, there's a lot of concern around um, changes in our insect populations globally which could mean, you know, very substantial impacts on our food supply chain, for instance, right? So these risks are definitely starting to be on the horizon, um, especially also for firms, for investors, right? And we've recently had a string of discussions around these types of questions, and they're definitely not very well quantified at the moment here. So for time constraints, I won't go through all these boundaries here. I've just given, you know, some examples, but I guess the big question really is, you know, how are all these um, changes perhaps impacting us, right? We have similar questions around the use of phosphorus and nitrogen, how it impacts agriculture in the future and how degraded ecosystems, you know, might impact uh, companies that are very dependent on them. So we certainly have sectors, you know, where we have a very high dependence on ecosystems and that's the agricultural sector, right? Aquaculture, forestry, but also any type of company that has got a supply chain anchored in ecosystem and ecosystem services. So for instance, closing industry is an example, right? Where the industry definitely heavily draws on natural resource inputs, unless you use synthetic fibers, of course, right? But um, that's definitely also where we see those types of impacts channeling through. Um, we also have other kind of outcomes resulting from this. So for instance, when we, when we think about the current offsetting industry, right, which is also very much focusing on essentially planting trees, right, or looking into nature solutions. This has also got an impact on land system change, land system use, and so on, right? If you're only planting a monoculture um, to try and offset, that's probably not really solving issues around ecosystem loss in the long run, right? So what's happening here? What can we do? What should we be doing? What's happening? I have sort of looked at this given that, you know, we are currently in a finance a symposium and a finance conference. I've sort of look, looked at it from the angle of, you know, what are the challenges here for finance research? And we definitely see a disconnect, right, when we look at finance research on the one hand and these types of global change frameworks. I've put one in to the presentation here, but you'll definitely find other ones when you look into, into this further, right? So we have really not had much of an overlap and much of a connection happening there in the past. There are certainly points of connection emerging, and I'll talk a little bit about that on the following slides as well, right? But ultimately, we don't really have this sort of direct mapping on, you know, these are areas in finance of concern, and this is of concern in a global change setting, right? Um, I guess what we really see is, you know, I guess in finance, you're very interested in, in uh, the financial impacts and implications. And I think consequently, a lot of the research has really remained very much anchored 
on the impacts of environmental change, but often in the form of carbon or energy policies or changes, right? Um, and how that impacts questions of direct importance for, you know, firm performance, for asset valuation and so on, right? I mean, for good reasons, that's ultimately, you know, what a lot of finance research is interested in. What does it mean in terms of financial outcomes, in terms of financial performance and so on? However, that's not necessarily opening us up to a broader consideration around, you know, a broader set of impacts. And I guess when we look into the whole area of climate change, right, with what's happening, we are also getting, I guess, you know, a very standard kind of setting for our research, right? So for instance, we have COP26 in Glasgow that immediately is, you know, introducing policy changes. So I guess the researcher in us is always very interested in kind of looking into the pre and post around, you know, these types of conference settings or, you know, policy um, signals that are being sent. And I think that's that's definitely a really great area of research, you know, so don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be doing this, right, but I'm kind of saying that it lends itself to a particular type of research setup and research setting that obviously makes it harder to study more interconnected risks beyond those types of settings, so perhaps an area for us to explore how we can actually, you know, factor in interconnected risks better in the future as well. That's so it. as I said, sorry? Just to let you know, you're about four or five minutes left. Um. I'm almost there, good news. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, um, you know, we have definitely seen a, a integration of some of these concerns in ESG metric frameworks, right? So it's not like we don't have any data on any of this at all, right? Um, so those of you who've worked with ESG metrics, you, you know, you will notice that there are definitely links or some links to scientific frameworks. Um, but there are definitely some shortcomings here. So certainly the idea of limits or boundaries is not reflected, right? So you're reporting against ESG indicators, but it's not really telling you, look, there's an upper limit or there's an upper boundary. This is it for your company, right? Um, it doesn't really have that idea in place at all. Um, where we see the biggest issues happening at the moment is definitely that it's very hard to understand what's happening down the corporate supply chain. Um, there's definitely a lot of stuff that's not really being mapped, uh, where data is not really being captured. And we often also don't really get the local picture, you know, impacts that are happening at the local stakeholder level in terms of biodiversity loss or even social issues, you know, such as uh, indigenous rights violations. We've definitely seen that with the Rio Tinto case, right? And all the controversies there around indigenous artifacts and so on. So there are definitely limits here in terms of using these data. Um, so good news is there's definitely stuff happening here, right? Um, we are currently seeing the development of the task force for nature related financial disclosures. It's very much in line with what the um, climate change equivalent was trying to do. So attempts to capture how nature um, positively or negatively can impact companies. But we also see an attempt here to create metrics in this space and you know carbon emissions as i said can be very easily accessed through available data sets but assessing nature i think is a much bigger challenge here so i see definitely a need for us as finance researchers to have an input into these discussions to see what metrics are actually suitable in order to assess these complex interconnected risks, right? We don't have good frameworks in place yet, so I can't give you the solution, but I think I definitely see an impetus here for us to, you know, uh, look into this area and provide input and research into these types of developments, right? So in this entire area, um, we have got ongoing research here as well, right? I guess I want to leave you with three points at the end of my uh, presentation, right? So I think it's absolutely imperative that we address climate change, right? So my presentation is sort of, you know, looking at this, okay, a potential side effects of not considering 
other types of risks alongside climate change, you know, that might lead to a selective attention. You see that in debates, for instance, around nuclear power, right? When you just take into consideration carbon emissions, nuclear is actually a pretty good option, right? But if your aim is not just to minimize carbon emissions, but to minimize toxic waste alongside, you suddenly see that the decision parameter changes, right? So I guess that's my point here, that we kind of have to think a little bit about, you know, where do we want to put the attention and what does it mean in terms of outcomes, right? Moving beyond carbon and ESG metrics, I think will be challenging for us, in particular in the finance research field, right? We have a lot of data gaps there at the minute, so we can't really run some quick regressions here to see what's happening in terms of biodiversity and nature loss. I think this is requiring a different set of research that is looking much more into the interconnectedness of impacts. And I think definitely there is a need for us to consider co-benefits and detriments of a focus on you know, carbon to avoid that. We just have a carbon tunnel vision and nothing else going on, right? So I'll leave you with that picture here as at night. It's actually one of my favorite uh, graphics because it just shows so much the extent of the problem and the challenge that we are facing, right? You see the entire planet has essentially been converted by humans. We see a lot of sprawl of energy infrastructure. And this is essentially us lighting the night sky. And in a lot of instances with uh, carbon uh, intensive energy sources. All right, here are our contact details in case you'd like to get in touch or discuss this any further. I know we're a little bit limited in the sense that I'm not really there in person. So please feel free to reach out. And thank you again for the invitation to present to you today. And we are definitely happy in the remaining five minutes to, to tackle any questions or comments or you know to, to just have a bit of a chat with you. So thank you very much. Thank you um, so much, Martina. It was a fascinating discussion and talk and um, some thought-provoking um, ideas there. Has anybody got a question they would like to ask, Martina? Uh, so, Martina, uh, thank you very much again for doing this. It's Ivan. Um, I guess what my question is, um, I, I've been following the U taxonomy quite a bit, and I think it tries to deal with this uh, maybe not so much the planetary boundaries, but the, the single focus on, on climate with this sort of do no significant harm uh, type criteria. I wonder if that's something that you've thought about in, 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 in your work. Um, and I guess the second, a second question is, well, how, you know, if we're used to doing empirical research, how can we do research that sort of encompasses all these factors? Um, yeah, look, I guess, you know, in um, terms of, have I actually stopped sharing my screen? No. Okay, there we go. This might be a little bit easier. <laughs> um, so, you know, I guess for us, really, um, the challenge will definitely be, you know, as you said, to look into research that is potentially multi-criteria in focus, right? And I guess, you know, that's always the point. If you gather data and, you know, focus on that particular data set and then derive conclusions based on that, it means that ultimately you are limited to those kind of insights, right? Um, so the challenge for us, I think definitely will be to move beyond that. I mean, at the moment, like I've seen a, some interesting research coming out of this and it is definitely not, um, you know, um, so quantitative in the sense that, you know, they are really, you know, factoring in a large number of metrics and running that against uh, uh, corporate um, outcomes. But uh, the idea of that particular research that I've seen coming out is sort of, you know, more like, it's probably more case-based oriented at this point in time to more fully try and understand, you know, what are the potential range of impacts and consequences that companies are facing, right? So I think at the moment, we are very limited still on the individual cases and on this case-based scenario of actually deriving these insights. 
But my hope is that these types of cases will give us some really interesting insights and perhaps also additional metrics that we should be incorporating, right? So, I mean, I'm not making this point of, you know, include a whole bunch of variables and see where that leads you, right? I guess my point is just, you know, that we need to kind of think through. I think some of the caveats, if we just focus on making recommendations based on minimizing carbon, because if you minimize one uh, parameter, you might actually, you know, potentially maximize others, right? So you might have solutions that are very low carbon, but that have actually got other side effects in place. So, you know, uh, I think if research just thinks through those potential limitations or caveats, that's probably already getting us a long way in the right direction without necessarily incorporating all of that into an empirical setting. Yeah. Um, Martina, thank you very much for that response and um, your insights. Uh, sadly, we've run out of time, which is a great shame because I think we could sit here for another half hour, an hour and, and have a wonderful debate. But um, I do want to thank you again. We do look forward to welcoming you on to campus at some stage and you'll be, uh, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to connect soon. Uh, but please stay online and listen to, I think you've got some, a co-author yeah. presenting in the near future. So um, thank you. That's again. right. Thank you so much. <laughs>